بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم صلى الله وسلم على سيد محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله we covered uh, tahara yesterday and najasa which is the impurity and uh, so before we get into the prayer um, <coughs> We'll look at the uh, removing Najasa quickly and then um, the um, you have to remove Najasa uh, before you can pray because you need a Tahara min al Hadath. Women al Khabath. And when we do the wudu, he'll go into detail about the hadath. Khabath is anything that's impure, so you have to have, uh, you have to be free of impure substances. If there's a ha'il between it, then it's permissible, like a, uh, a baby that has a, a diaper on. So, or if you're praying on a prayer mat and underneath it is najasa, but the actual place that you pray on has to be pure. Um, that even if there was najasa, when you went into sajda in the empty space between your chest and your uh, knees, uh, it's still considered valid. Um, but to remove najasa, you need pur purifying water. And uh, I mean, obviously, if you get into real uh, details, you find, like, for instance, in, in Syria, um, the women do an extra rinse cycle. On the on the clothes, you know, in the washing machine, because if you if you put detergent in, the water's not uh, purifying it, and the rinse cycle, the initial rinse cycle, is actually um, contaminated by the detergent. So they actually do a second rinse cycle for that reason. So that's something to think about. Um, also. Uh, if 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 it's um, if a woman has a long dress, which is done for sitar, not for any other reason, it has to be done specifically because she's wearing it uh, out of modesty. Then anything that uh, get, soils it as she's walking is ma'afwanhu. It's it's excused uh, as long as it's not wet. So the Prophet ﷺ was asked about that, and he said. Uh, يطهره ما وراه. You know what, what's after it will purify it. So um, and then also uh, you shouldn't pray in if if somebody who's not a Muslim gives you a, some clothes or something uh, that he wore. Um, you shouldn't pray in it, and not because of najasa or anything, but because they don't have the same ihtiraz. They don't guard themselves from najasa. The same is true for a janitor's clothing. I mean, these are all things that they mention um, in there. Um, so things, and then children who don't know about that also. Um, and the basic, if it's, if you have a, uh, you know, some kind of exudate or something like that, the amount of what they call a baghla, dirham al baghla, which is the uh, mule's dirham, if you look on the inner um, legs of a front legs of a mule, there's a there's a size that's the size that the fuqah identified. It's it's about half a dollar. That amount is uh, excused. So if you prayed with that amount of um, of uh, exudate or something on, you know, sometimes you find that on your clothes. Um, those things are excused. And then. Um, also, uh, mud, um, things, even if there was najasa in a place, but the rain comes and gets it, it's excused unless it's ainun najasa. So if you actually see uh, feces or something that's, that's on you, if it's just mud and, you know, there's a possibility that it was mixed, but it's not clear, then that's uh, excused. Um, And then also, uh, if something falls on you and you're doubtful about it, and you ask somebody who's trustworthy and, and they know the area, 
then that's um, safe. Otherwise, uh, you're supposed to wash things off. Um, Now about the um, you know the dog the wulugh al kalb, um, if a dog <coughs> wulugh is actually to go in and the, how the dog licks. So if a dog simply was sniffing in a thing, you actually don't have to wash it. If a dog actually licked it one time, it's the same. Um, if a dog ate in food, you, you, the food's still valid to eat. Um, but if he licks in then it's mandub, it's not wajib, it's mandub. So that amr is for nadab, to wash it uh, seven times, which is the sunnah. And you don't need to use um, you know, uh, dirt after that. So now this uh, section, which is not in Ibn Ashur, but it's an important section, is adab qada al haja. Adab, which is a foundational principle in Islam, uh, adab, generally, the, the things that are, are, are from the adab of Islam are mandub, they're recommended things. Um, cultures differ in adab, so you get protocols that go with cultures. Um, for instance, Syrian adab is not necessarily the same as Egyptian adab or Hyderabadi adab or, uh, you know, uh, Lahori adab. Cultures have different things that they see as the comportment, the way you carry yourself. Uh, in a society. In a classical Muslim culture, it was, um, if, if a man didn't cover his head, it was seen as a very negative thing. Um, and in fact, in the books of fiqh, it says that their, their shahada would, would be invalidated because they couldn't testify against another person because it was such a breach of the comportment. But there's nothing in the sharia that says you have to wear uh, a hat so that, that has to do with adab of a culture. Now, obviously, those, those type of things have, even Western clothes. There's, there's fatwas from the uh, late 19th century and early 20th century that wearing a Western hat uh, was uh, ridda, you know, it was kufr to do that. Because Muslims didn't wear brimmed hats. Um, the idea being, you know, you couldn't do sajda with it. But if you go to Niger, Muslims wore brimmed hats. You know, they have big hats that protected them from the sun when they were working out. So again, uh, those things relate to time and place. You couldn't revive a, a fatwa from the Ottoman late 19th century that people who wear baseball caps are uh, murtad or something like that. But the adab, there's a lot of things in adab that are not necessarily from the sharia per se. Um, but these are the adab that the Prophet ﷺ taught um, so it's just that distinction between comportment in a culture which is related to culture and not necessarily from Islam per se. But Islam, the, the religion acknowledges that. It acknowledges culture. And so uh, to, to breach those things in a culture is seen as something that uh, you, you shouldn't do out of respect for or deference for that culture like pointing you know, your feet, sitting with your feet uh, facing towards somebody in uh, certain Arab countries is, is a real aib. Or taking something with your left hand is aib. It's an insult to the person because left hand is used for uh, impure things. So these are, these are the, ad the adab of the culture. The adab of the religion are things that are men considered mandub, and uh, oftentimes they come from the Prophet ﷺ, but sometimes they come from the ulama in recognizing that uh, the, these uh, uh, these are things that are important, like adab al-bahth wa al-munadhara is a good example of that. So he says the, uh, the adab of qada al-haja is jirusun bi tahirin, to sit in a clean place, uh, and then wa satrun li qurbihi, um, uh, you know, to to when you become close to that place where you're going, then it should be done in a place where people can't see you, and that's why it's actually called ghaiq. Is uh, the huta is a is a lower area. It's ard mun khafida, and so ghaiq, which now means feces, originally meant a low uh, area because that's where people went 
to do qada al haja Even during the Prophet Sallallahu lifetime, they did not have outhouses and they didn't have toilets. One of the first innovations, according to the, some of the Sahaba, was introducing uh, toilets into the houses. Uh, some, some of the early Muslims were very opposed to that because they thought it brought in uh, uh, impurities and also the khubath and the khaba'it, which is, is uh, I'll talk about in a second. So, um, and then also the i'timad, uh, actually putting more pressure uh, on your left uh, foot uh, and raising the right foot slightly, the heel of the right foot. Now, what's interesting about that is, you know, a lot of the, the uh, you know, the problems that uh, people have like constipation and also you have, um, um, uh, you know, diverticuli. Uh, there, there's a lot of intestinal problems that would, would be relieved by this. Also hemorrhoids and things because hemorrhoids come from uh, too much pressure often, exerting pressure. But this, this actually is, is um, I mean, I've read in, in, uh, in you know, when I was uh, doing nursing, I had a book that, um, actually said that for people with uh, problems that they should put pressure on their uh, descending colon. Um, and that was one of the textbooks that I had. So um, th this is uh, the way the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught. The, the Victorian um, toilet was uh, a, an innovation from the English. Uh, prior to that, everybody squatted. Um, it's not healthy, actually, to... to um, even modern medicine knows that, that it's not healthy. Uh, the body's designed uh, to have optimal uh, evacuation of the bowels in a squatting position. So squatting is actually a much healthier way, um, you know. But, uh, and now, unfortunately, a lot of Muslim countries are adopting the, uh, these, these uh, methods now. But this, this is the way the Prophet Sallallahu actually taught to... Um, um, one of the uh, one of the uh, Salman al Farisi actually told one of the Mushrikun who was saying, you know, he's teaching you everything, and he said, and Salman said he he's even taught us how to to relieve ourselves. So the Prophet I mean, that's part of the all-encompassing nature of his tradition. But these things are very consistent with what we know. So that that is something that that uh, is taught. And then also to spread slightly the, you know, the thighs and to cover your head, uh, and not to look around. And this is obviously outdoors. Um, to say, uh, Bismillah before you go in. And then also to say, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al khubathi wal khaba'ith. Before you go into a place. The khubath are the, uh, the khabith is, uh, is, uh, the, you know, sh uh, foul shaitan, a male, and the khaba'it is the plural of khabitha, which is uh, the female. And uh, the idea is that the, the uh, uh, foul creatures from the unseen world tend to be around dirty or filthy places. Um, it's very interesting, one of the things about, uh, you know, and, and people at work, detectives and criminologists know this, when they get into... Um, Really, like psychopathic people, and they, I mean, if you see some of the photographs of the the places where they live and the kind of filth and squalor that they live in, it's it's it, it actually a lot of police are like they're just overwhelmed by the filth uh, that that. So th there's a reality to that idea. You know, cleanliness is 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 not just um, a physical reality, but it's also a metaphysical um, reality. So, um, and then also when you leave, Alhamdulillah, Ladi Adhaba Ani Al Adha, I mean, there's different wa'afani, there's different du'as. My favorite one is Alhamdulillah, Ladi Razakani Ladatahu, Wa Abqa Fiya Kuwatahu, Wa Adhaba Ani Adahu, and Rufranika. That's a beautiful du'a because it, it's, uh, you're really thanking Allah for, uh, for the food in the first place. You know, praise be the one who, who, who provided me with the delight of food, and and allowed me to absorb the the the, the energy of the food, قوته, you know the the caloric uh, benefits of the food, and has 
uh, removed from me the harmful things of the food. So it's it's uh, it's just a really comprehensive du'a about that. But one of the great blessings uh, of life is having healthy uh, digestion, and to be aware of that. Marab uh, Tarhaj uh, told me that um, you know when it said about uh, Nuh that he was Abdan Shakur and he was a grateful slave servant. That uh, you know in in Tafsir, uh, I think it's in the Sawi's Jalalain. He mentioned that. He never relieved himself without thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That that, that is, it's, it's an important, um, just thing to remember that Allah can shut that down and, uh, and people who are in medicine know what incontinence is or what, uh, being continent, uh, you know, somebody who has, uh, uh, you know, the inability to urinate or to defecate. I mean, it's, it's just really, uh, a, a horrible state to be in. So just being aware of that blessing. And then also um, to avoid like holes. You know, I'll just tell you one story. It was a true story. Um, years ago, I was in uh, Arizona and, and I was with uh, Hakim Archuleta. For people who know Hakim Archuleta, he will confirm this story. Eyewitness. Hakim Archuleta was with me and there was a Somalian man, Abdul Qadr. Very interesting guy. And Somalis are very, uh, you know, they have, uh, Somalis are dream people. You know, they have a lot of dreams. East Africans generally are very, uh, you know, they're very just in tune to a kind of dream world. And so if you, if you have any Somali friends, you'll know they have amazing dreams. It just goes with that. I think they take away the citizenship if you don't. But uh, the, uh, the, um, we were, we were outdoors and, and watering, Abdul Qadr was watering something and there was a hole there. And he started, uh, uh, putting the water in. And I think Hakim said, you know, you, you shouldn't do that because some animal probably lives there. And then, uh, all of a sudden all the, this, uh, straw started coming out of the hole. Do you know? And, uh, uh, and I was like, uh, I looked down, I said, you know, that's probably its furniture. Right? I mean, really, that's what I said. And, um, anyway, we, we, uh, we went on, did what we did. That night, this is an absolutely true story. That night, we went, uh, into town, uh, for a few hours. And, uh, when we came back, the house had been robbed and all the furniture was gone in the house we were living in. I mean, literally all the furniture was gone. You could ask Hakim about this story. And we really felt like, that was some kind of gin or something. <laughs> and we took his furniture. And so he just took all of our furniture. But uh, don't, don't mess with the holes, you know. <laughs> so that's ittiqa'u juhrin. You know, that's what it says. Do not urinate in holes. <laughs> and that was a lesson that I learned, um, that that's real. Um, and also wind, like don't, I mean, this is kind of common sense, but don't urinate into wind. <laughs> don't spit into wind either, and I think everybody's done that at least once, if you're a man. Women don't spit. Um, and also, on a, a road or a place of shade, um, places where people will sit, you know, it, it should be a place. I mean, this is obviously, in our culture, it's quite rare. Um, but it does happen. I mean, people have to uh, relieve themselves on, you know, you find yourself out somewhere. Um, so, but, but these, these are all the adab of doing these things. And then also, um, not, uh, mentioning anything, uh, from dhikr, like Allah's name, uh, the um, Quran and ayah of Quran. In fact, uh, the, some of the Sahaba used to put rocks in their mouth. When they, because they were so accustomed to doing dhikr, that they would actually put rocks in their mouth when they went to, to, um, relieve themselves, just to remind themselves not to do dhikr. Because they were just so used to doing dhikr all the time. Um, uh, and then also to, when you go in, you put your right foot first. When you come out, you put your left foot first. It's the opposite of your, the masjid and your house. The masjid and the house, you do the opposite. 
Uh, and again, you know, these are these are some of the interesting things about Islam. But if you if you study the nun study on Alzheimer's disease, I mean, one of the things they said about the plaque buildup and breakdown of uh, mental acuity was the fact that people people that were more conscious and um, and uh, like they they did a nun study in Canada that was huge, and these nuns all ha they did it over you know several years, but they all had these habits of writing out what they were going to do and then consciously doing things through the day, and so the, these things aren't uh, insignificant things in terms of just being more present because a lot of people, as you know, are on automatic pilot out there. Um, they they just simply turn off. And, and, and being present, you know, I like in, in, the, in the South Asian culture, with the Sahaba, they refer to him as Hazrat Abbas, Hazrat Omar. Hadara means presence. And so the more present you are, um, the more alive you are, the more uh, aware you are. And, the, the, you know, there's people that check out entirely, and, and you'll meet them, I'm sure. I mean, uh, a lot of people in monotonous jobs do that. They literally just are on, and that's why you know you go to the grocery store and they're just not there. You know, they, and they say the same things to each person. Um, how are you? You know, have a nice day. Uh, paper or plastic? You know, it's literally it's automatic pilot, and that's why if you actually talk to them, you kind of, you'll see. Uh, you know, they come back to you because they're just so used to going. So a lot of people are like that. And this is really about being present, about remembering. Uh, the, the more you're able to do that, uh, the more rich your life is. And also, the more you can become aware of your Lord. Um, and then, um, also not facing the Qibla, uh, or putting it to your back when you defecate or urinate. Now this, the ulama say it doesn't include closed spaces. If that's the way the... The, the toilet was made. But generally, in Muslim houses, if you do build your own house or have an architect, you should put the, po the toilet the, the opposite direction so that you're not facing the qibla or with your back to it. And then, um, uh, also, uh, istibra is an obligation. For the man, this is um, to milk very gently because you can, if you do this, and they emphasize gently, you know, uh, in, in the books of fiqh, to milk the, the, the actual shaft uh, by taking your uh, finger and your thumb and just milking to get the last remnants of the urine um, out of the... Uh, some people have a post-urine type of incontinence where they'll you know, they'll get some drops of urine. If that's the case, then the, the sunnah is to wet your, uh, your penis b before you leave the, the bathroom so that you don't get waswasa. Uh, but, um, and then if you have incontinence, which is even if it's one time during the day, uh, then there's another ruling that goes with that, which we'll, do, we'll deal with uh, when we get to wudu. Um, and then, uh, when you clean also, um, this, you know, the, the, the sunnah was to clean with both water and uh, stone, to use stone first. Obviously this is, you know, today people use uh, toilet paper. Um, so to clean with the toilet paper first and then to use uh, the water. Um, but, the, you know, again, these are very, uh, a lot of mental illness out there is related to urine and feces. I mean, you know, people don't know that out here, but you'll, you'll notice. I mean, if you look at a lot of the, um, uh, a lot of the swear words um, here, like if you look at Arab swear words, for instance, they don't relate to urine and feces. And, you know, it's very interesting that this culture's, Ways of expressing frustration and anger all relate to, uh, you know, defecation and urination and things like that. So um, the gift of knowing about this and the sanity of this. I mean, there's a lot of people here that have obsessive compulsive disorder um, and uh, they feel unclean. There's a lot of people that have a sense of feeling unclean. Uh, there's a lot of mental illness that relates to feeling unclean. 
Uh, so the, this is a great blessing to ha to know this and to know how important it is for fitrah because fitrah people, um, this is really part of fitrah. This is an ancient thing. This is not like just an Islamic thing. This is a thing that fitrah people have. They know about uh, these things and uh, that one should should uh, be be distanced from them. So uh, and then finally. Uh, Uh, let's see. So, uh, one would use, if you use toilet paper, then it would be to wet the toilet paper and then to use water, just pure water. If you only use the toilet paper with the water, it's fine as long as you've removed, um, all of the, uh, the najasa from your body and, and it's also not you should not go into um, you know you shouldn't it's just the outward that's all it is um, is cleaning the outward um, and that and then obviously uh, it's an obligation to, to uh, remove many uh, urine and hyal uh, and nifas um, and then also the urine of a female that spreads past the exit lot so she has to make sure that her um, area is clean um, before uh, and then also with many if you have medhi which is a, a lustful emission um, either from through fantasy or through touch or something like that or, or um, uh, if, if, if you have medhi then the, the male is, is should uh, uh, should wash all of the uh, uh, you know the the uh, his organ uh, to do that, and the, with the intention of removing that. Um, uh, but the uh, and then obviously you know th there's a, there's a permissibility of using something only dry as long as it cleans. So, for instance, people that do just use the toilet paper, if they don't have water available or something like that, it does clean it. Um, so, that that's basically the uh, the section on Qadha al haja Does anybody have any questions? So, now we go to um, the section on um, Wudu. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's, you can do that. Okay. It's just the sunnah is to do both. Yeah, and then obviously soap. Even though there wasn't soap at that time, soap is a, a ni'mah, and the the Muslims have been using soap. They used soap long before it ever came to the Europeans. So, you know, soap is, uh, is something that people should use also. And then keeping fingernails short is important. That's a fitra thing for both male and female uh, to, you know, maintain that cleanliness. Um, so the, the wudu now is from uh, a word wada'a. And wada'a is bright or brilliant. Um, there's actually a word that I found in the dictionary that kind of really shocked me, which is called lustrations, which is um, it's a ritual washing, washing with water. Um, and it comes from luster, which is bright uh, in, uh, in Latin. So I just thought that was really interesting that there must have been some, uh, something that people were doing somewhere. Uh, the lustrations, um, but that's that's what wudu brightens the face. People that do wudu uh, have brighter faces than people that don't do wudu. Um, and the uh, the wudu is an obligation. Obviously, it's a condition uh, of prayer. If you don't have wudu, then your prayer is uh, is invalid unless you've done a substitute, which is tayammum. The uh, the ulama say that if somebody is on a, a cross, like crucified, or if they're 
um, chained in a in a uh, a cell that and they can't do any type of ritual uh, purification, then the prayer is no longer valid. So that's how important the the wudu is um, to uh, and the tayammum to prayer. The uh, the the wudu in the Maliki Madhab, and there, there's four things mentioned in the Quran in wudu. In the Maliki Madhab, there's seven obligations. Abu Hanifa takes just the Nasr al Quran with the with his obligations of wudu. But Imam Malik has seven obligations. The the Prophet ﷺ did wudu uh, for usually for every prayer. So even if you're in wudu, it's uh, it's a good thing to do uh, wudu over wudu. Nurun ala nur is light upon light. Um, so the obligations or the fara'id of wudu are seven. And obviously you have to have ma'un tahirun wa tahor. It has to be pure and purifying. Uh-huh. It has to be pure and purifying. So the uh, so you you basically uh, and then also if it's an open container, right? Then you put it on your right side. If it's a closed container, you put it on your left side. Most of us do will do now in in uh, faucets, which is unfortunate. And um, the uh, you know when when I lived in. Uh, in uh, in uh, the Emirates and when I was in Saudi and I was living mostly with Mauritanians. Mauritanians do not do wudu in faucets. They just don't. Um, even if they're in houses, they do it sitting down and they do it uh, with a pitcher. Um, and the the quality of your wudu is much better when it's done like that. I guarantee you. Um, Sidi Ahmed Zarruq said. Your presence in the prayer is dependent on your presence in your wudu. The more presence you have in your wudu, the more presence you'll have in your prayer. Um, so we tend to forget that wudu is actually an act of ibadah. It's a separate act of ibadah. That the Prophet Sallallahu did wudu when he, when he did not need to do wudu. He did it as an act of ibadah. Now wudu is really done as something that goes with the prayer. You, you know, it's just something, oh, I have to do wudu, but the reason I'm doing it is for the prayer. Whereas wudu, in and of itself, is an act of ibadah. And uh, Allah loves the, you know, the, 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 the people that purify themselves. Um, and so, the, uh, the act of tahara itself is, is, a, is a, um, it's important. And, and uh, you know, when I saw, Marabt uh, has the first time I saw him do wudu, it just changed my whole uh, perspective on wudu. I mean, it really did, because he he is so present in his wudu. And um, and it's a dhikr. I mean, it's very clear. It's just, it is a dhikr. Whereas now people go into the bathroom, it's makru to do wudu in the bathroom. Um, and they do it very quickly because, you know, you just want to go and get out. So... Uh, doing it, if you're able to, to do it um, with a pitcher, um, it's, you'll see a difference. So, the obligations of wudu, the first one is belk, because ghasal in the Arabic language means washing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, inshallah, I'll do it again. Uh, you do delk, which is uh, rubbing, and then continuity, which is fawr. Fawr actually means hurriedly. In Arabic, and some of the ulama say that it was an unfortunate use. Uh, some of the Malikis prefer muwalat because fawr, they say you him a tasarra that you do it fast, and it's not meant to be done fast. Uh, it's just that you do it um, with continuity, so you don't uh, you know wash your hands and then go and you know, stir the pot for a few minutes and then come back and, and wash your face and then go have a telephone conversation. <laughs> that That's what they mean. It, you should have muwalat, which is continuity. And then also a niya fi bad'ihi, to have um, an intention at the outset uh, of it because in the amaru bin niyat, actions are by intentions. So the act of wudu is by intention. There are certain acts of worship where you have to have an intention or else... It's just not valid. Wudu is one of them. There are certain acts where you don't have to have the intention. 
the fact that you're doing it is is suffices as an intent, like paying your zakat. The fact that you're doing your zakat is suffices. The uh, it's always better to have a niya, but if you did it without the niya, it would still be valid. And some of the ulama say the tawajjuh is a niya, that you don't actually have to have a, just the fact that you've like I'm going to do ghusl is a niya, right? The fact that you've set out to do that or that you've set out to do will do. But the niya should be removal of a state of lesser in, ritual impurity, rafa hadath al asghar, to remove something like uh, urine or feces or uh, wind or the ful- uh, fulfillment of an obligation so that you're fulfilling the fard, the shart of doing wudu or istibahat al mana, you know, that you're rendering the, the, the whatever's a preventive, you're removing it in order to rem- render your, your act of worship permissible. So those are the different ways that you can do it. Um, and then washing the face from ear to ear and from the natural hairline. So if you're bald, even bald people have, there's a, there's a natural hairline that they know, uh, in their, in, in their, um, thing. But if you do have like, uh, receded thing, then you should wash if it's where the natural thing. Once it starts going, then it's on the head. But but certain people have a high brow, and then some people have a low brow. Um, so uh, it's it's from that brow point, ear to ear. So the from the pinna you know, from the pinna to the pinna ear to ear, and then um, and then. Uh, from top to bottom, so the chin here, and uh, and then underline for men. If you if you can see your your uh, your skin beneath your beard, if your beard's not thick enough, uh, and you can actually see the flesh, then you have to go down uh, to the flesh. If your beard is thick and you don't have that, then you don't need to do that. You just going over the beard um, is enough uh, to do that. So. Um, and then washing both hands from the fingertips up to and including the elbows. Uh, interlace the fingers of both hands. So like washing, making sure you wash between fingers going up there to the elbow and down. And then also getting in, uh, you know, making sure you cover those. And then uh, wiping over the head with wet hands. So you take water, um, but it's a wipe. It's not a wash. So you don't you know, and then you go over the head. The sunnah is to come back, but at least going over the head to the back. Um, and then for the women, uh, the, uh, with the braids, uh, you know, we'll get into that. Um, but, you know, the, uh, going all the way down. Imam Sawi, even though it's a, the dominant opinion is to do the whole hairline, but Imam Sawi, uh, said it was enough to do the the head without going all the way down on the uh, and then washing both feet up to and including the ankles so which is very important especially the heel so those are the obligations of the wudu uh, the seven obligations and then the sunnah of the wudu which are sunnah in the plural are, is also seven um, beginning by washing both hands up to and including the wrists so the wrist goes up to where the, the wrist bone there is. Um, and then a return wipe from the head, which is back to front. Wiping both ears. So wiping the ear uh, and uh, rinsing the mouth, uh, which is to obviously put water. If It's also the siwak is encouraged. Um, it's mandub and you'll get in the fada'il there. But uh, if uh, um, it's enough just to rinse the mouth and then lightly sniffing water up. So you hear some people, you know, like a kind of yogic uh, thing. But it's actually just, it's a light sniff to, uh, and then uh, blowing the water out of the nostrils with the, so right hand up and then left hand down. Uh, and then following the correct order of the obligations is a sunnah. So if you did wudu out of order, it's a valid wudu. But it's a sunnah to do it in the order of, uh, of the wudu itself. And then, um, an addition that Imam al Akhdari, uh, mentions that Ibn Ashur doesn't mention is renewing water for the wiping of the ears. 
So actually, uh, you know, when you do your wiping of the head, and then some people go directly to the ears, that it's a sunnah to renew the water. Uh, so that would be an eighth one that Al-Akhbari mentions. So those are the uh, the sunan of wudu, and then you have the fada'il of the wudu. So the, the fada'il of the wudu are um, 11 according to Ibn Ashir, Ihda Ashara. Uh, the first one is saying the Bismillah at its out, uh, at its uh, outset. Uh, so Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, when you start the uh, the um, the uh, the wudu, and then performing the wudu in a place free of impurity. So finding a clean place uh, to do the wudu, conserving the water. So the Prophet used only one mud of water to perform it, which is actually. Uh, just over half a liter of water. And then placing the vessel on one's right side if it is open to facilitate dipping with the right hand. Once you've washed the right hand. So initially you wash the right hand. Once you've washed it, you can dip into the vessel um, and do that. And the same is true for the, uh, the, uh, the left side. You pour it onto the right hand like that if it's, if it's a spout type. So you either dip in. If your hand's clean, you can dip in. You know, but uh, you initially uh, wash your hands, and then now also in the Maliki Madhab, the water is pure even after the wudu. It's makru to use it, but it's considered pure. In the in the Shafi'i Madhab, it's not. It's the water is it has a najasa uh, from the sins, so they don't reuse the uh, the water. But in Maliki, it's makru. You can you can reuse the water. Um, if you need to. So, what's that? Why, what do you mean? Because he didn't, he thought that that was ma'nawiya, it's not a hissi. You know, that the removing the sins was a spiritual meaning, it had nothing to do with the physicality of the water, so he didn't think the water was contaminated by that. But, if you look at that Japanese man who did all the studies with the water crystals, uh, one would tend to agree with the Shafi'i. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's an interesting point of, of the Shafi'i. Yeah, the water that comes off of you. Yeah, like if you have, you know, if, you, if, you're, if you're in a place where you have a tray under you, and so that water that's the, that runs off of your limbs, yeah, that, that can be reused in the Maliki Madhab. It's still considered uh, tahur. Somebody could use it after you, exactly. Like if you were in a place and you didn't have a lot of water, uh, somebody could use it after you. Yeah. And you would use that before you would do tayammum. Yeah. Got it? Yeah. Um, and then also uh, performing each washing a second time is a fifth fadila. And then performing it a third time is a sixth fadila. So each one of the repeats is a fadila. To do it more than that is israf. Uh, the, unless there's like with the feet, um, if you know if they're dirty and you need to make sure that the uh, it's getting down. Now also just about fingernail polish. Fingernail polish, and somebody can make a fortune if they design a fingernail polish that is water soluble. Because in, in, the, in Saudi Arabia, you would have like a bestseller. Because uh, it is a problem. And a lot of Muslim women now wear finger polish and don't know that your wudu is invalid without getting to the actual. That's why henna, uh, which is water soluble, is permissible, even though it dyes the nail polish. But to have a, a ha'il, which is to cover it with a physical. Uh, covering or fake nails, for instance, the wudu is invalid, and the same is for the feet. And then, beginning with the limbs on the right, so beginning with on the right side is a favila, it's a virtuous merit. Uh, and then, uh, the brushing one's teeth is tiak. Now, the, t you can use a toothbrush, you can use a siwak. Siwak is the toothbrush of the Prophet uh, that they used. Um, that's what they had in, in 7th century Arabia. There's no doubt for people that have used it, if you've been uh, in like uh, 
Saudi Arabia, for instance, on Hajj or something, and people buy because they're all over the place. They work and they're very effective, and they're actually your teeth feel cleaner if you use them properly than they do with uh, with uh, regular uh, toothbrush. But a toothbrush is fine. The beauty of the CWAC is that you cut it each time you use it, whereas toothbrushes are repeated. And th people know now, you know, that toothbrushes are come, become very dirty, and they actually become breeding. You know, they they breed. Uh, uh, illnesses and things like that and you know I mean they recommend people uh, change their toothbrush on a regular basis so um, the uh, you know it's it's uh, it's it's a good thing if people want to use a CWAC but it's not necessary if you uh, don't have a CWAC you can use your finger and that is uh, fulfills the merit of the uh, of the uh, of the wudu just using your finger when you're rinsing your mouth Put your finger in and just rub it around. Um, the Prophet said in a hadith, and this is mentioned in the Risala, in the commentaries on the Risala, uh, the Prophet, one of his sunnah was to, to floss, takhlilu asnanihi. And um, he used to floss with a, a palm fiber uh, that he would put through his teeth. And uh, he, he said in a hadith that the angels, تَتَأَذَّى الْمَلَائِكَةُ مِنْ طَعَامٍ بَيْنَ أَسْنَانَ الْمُصَلِّي that angels are disturbed by food between a person who's praying, between their teeth. So um, flossing is a sunnah, and if you, if there's any dentists in our group, they can tell you uh, how important that is. And now doctors increasingly, because they know before you have operations now, they want to have a, uh, they want you to get uh, your dental hygiene checked, because if you have, uh, you know, if you have infections in your mouth, it can actually affect your heart and, and other things. So the, the fact that our religion 1,400 years ago had so much emphasis on dental hygiene, to me, is one of the really amazing uh, miracles of the Prophet's life and because of the importance of dental hygiene um, today, now, just in people's overall health. I mean, there's a real connection between really good uh, dental health and the the health of your bloodstream, and so that that is a sunnah. Now, if you think about that, brushing your teeth before you do will do. I mean, that you're going to be brushing your teeth of, of three times a day at least. You know, if 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 you're an average person, so it's it's uh, amazing that this is the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then following the order of the sunnah in their respective order. So it's a sunnah to follow the order of wudu. It's a merit to follow the order of the sunnah. Um, and then wiping the head from the beginning of the forehead. And then running the fingers between the toes. And then Sidi uh, Khalil in his book adds as a merit that you make dua after completing the wudu. Allahumma. وسع لي في داري وبارك لي في رزقي وقنعني بما رزقتني ولا تفتني بما زويت عني that's one dua أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمد رسول الله اللهم اجعلني من التوابين واجعلني من المتطهرين there's different duas مربط الحاج always recited إن أنزمناه في ليلة القدر after every wudu that he did and I I don't know where he got that but he that that's something he did as a practice um, and and he actually uh, recommended that. So, um, and he was very strict in his adherence to the sunnah. Like he did not do things that he didn't have a. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I wouldn't drink the wudu water. Hmm? I don't. I don't know about that. That might be a South Asian. I don't know. I mean, it might be. I don't know. I've never heard that. To drink the wudu water. I mean, if you're Shafi'i, they wouldn't do that. What's that? Oh, what's left over uh, from the pot? Yeah, yeah, no, that's fine. Yeah, I mean, that's not, I haven't, that, that might be like something uh, mentioned. That, I mean, did you, were you taught that? We weren't taught to do it. We weren't taught to do it. Yeah. Yeah, no, that might be. I mean, that's more like probably from people of Tasawwuf. Some, yeah.
That's a good point. Water conservation. Mm -hmm. They would drink it. Yeah, no, the, uh, but the Sahaba would drink his leftover wudu also. If they could get hold of it. Yeah. No, no, no. The, the, they always drank the leftover wudu of the Prophet. So that's good if there's a righteous person, you know. Uh, but that's not mentioned in fiqh. I mean, I, I don't, I haven't seen that mentioned. But, uh, you know, there, those things are the practices that people do. Um, and then some of the makruhat of wudu, uh, the following acts are discouraged. Uh, exceeding the obligatory when wiping the head, so washing the head, you know. There's people that always think that, well, if wiping's good, washing's better, you know, that kind of attitude, like, but it's the, the, the it's always to follow the Prophet. What he did, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is the best thing. Um, washing beyond the regions specifically described, prescribed. So again, Abu Huraira's thing of going up into the forearm, uh, is is makru according to the uh, Maliki Madhab. Um, and then some of the additions of uh, Sidi Khalil, washing the limbs more than three times, speaking during wudu other than the remembrance of Allah. So if you're in a bathroom, you shouldn't be doing dhikr. Um, that's why it's makru to do wudu in, because it's sunnah to do dhikr during the, the wudu. So, but if you're in a bathroom, you shouldn't do that. Um, doing uh, dhikr of Allah, performing... Marab Tarhaj used to recite Qur'an during his wudu. So there's no specific dhikrs of... I mean, you'll find in the books these dhikrs of... You know, you ask Allah to remove the sins of the eye, the sins of... And you'll find those, but there's no specific dhikrs uh, with each of the limbs, but it's just dhikr generally. Performing wudu in an impure place, wasting water, al-israf, even if you're on a flowing river, uh, it is makru to waste water. And water conservation will become increasingly important in, in our lifetimes. I mean, especially young people, they're going to see, it's, there's going to be a lot of emphasis on water con conservation um, as time uh, goes on. So that's part of our religion. We should be teaching people that, not having the non-Muslims teach us about water conservation. Um, and then performing each washing uh, only once. Uh, performing will do using a vessel of gold or silver. Um, so, I mean, generally using vessels of gold and silver, we mentioned earlier, is, is muharram. Um, if there was no other vessel, uh, that's, that's, would, be makru to use that, something like that. The mudabbab or mumawah, which is a gold-plated, I mentioned the other day that there's a khilaf about that, but uh, if it's if it's slight, then in Maliki Madhab, there's no problem with that. If it's, you know, like they put it around the edges or something. Um, but generally, uh, even if it was done for an investment, so they even mentioned like if you bought a gold vessel and then you plated it with uh, lead, you're still not supposed to use it. Um, so it's not just about showing off. It's about not using gold or silver. Uh, if unable to maintain continuity, one should start where one left off. As long as the limbs do not dry in the elapsed time, given moderate weather. So if it's like this is moderate weather, it might be a little hot. Uh, but if you're in moderate weather, and say the telephone does ring, and you're in the middle of wudu, and you go and answer the phone, and you talk for uh, you know a peri period of time. If your limbs are still wet, then you can go back to where you started. If they've dried, then you need to start the wudu over again. And then things nawaqid al wudu, a missed obligation. If one remembers a missed obligation after time has elapsed, then one need only perform it. So if there was one thing that you missed in the thing, you can go back and just do that thing over. Uh, and then if one remembers a missed obligation during wudu or shortly thereafter, then one should return to it and complete what follows uh, in the original order after the missed limb. And then if one realizes that an obligation was missed after having prayed with an incomplete wudu, the prayer is invalid. So you need to do the wudu over and do the prayer over. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's better to be seated. 
No, you should do. It's actually the teeth is out at the onset before you actually go into the wudu, or you know when 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 you're uh, when you're um, when you're doing your mouth. Uh, if you're going to use the finger, then to do the finger. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But it's makru in the Madaki Medhab to brush to do siwak before the prayer, the way people do it in the masjid. Um, he considered that. And that's very strong, I think, because he was in Medina. And the fact that in Medina they considered that makru is, to me, very strong. And there's something kind of, to me, you know, even though I know it's in the other medhebs, it's like brushing your teeth in public, you know, which is a weird thing to do. And I think, um, but people do it. They pull out their siwak, and then some people put it in their shirt, and it's kind of like, you know... <laughs> so, anyway. so the things that nullify nawaqidul wudu oh then if one remembers a miss sunnah one need only repeat it for the subsequent prayers and the previous prayers done with the miss sunnah are valid so if you missed a sunnah the prayer is valid and you, you only do that for the subsequent prayers the nawaqidul wudu are the things that nullify wudu at urination Nullifies will do so any passing of urine, the passing of wind, um, so and then incontinence if rare, either yanduru and rare means if it's less than once a day, then it uh, so people that have some 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 somebody can sneeze and they get a release of urine or even laugh and they get a release of urine, uh, so, uh, so th- those are types of incontinence, but if it's if it's a medical problem. Then you, you have salas al baul, and also salas al riyah. There's people that have incontinence to wind, so they're passing wind. If they, uh, I mean, these are all medical problems that the sharia deals with. Um, and then defecation, uh, heavy sleep. So you have light sleep, heavy sleep, right? Um, the the light sleep is where you can hear people talking. So you're you're you know you're you're kind of in a a pre-sleep state, but you're definitely not you're not paying attention. Um, that doesn't break the wudu. If the light is long, right, then uh, you you should do wudu again. You don't you know uh, it's not an obligation if the, the the you go light sleep for a while as long as you don't lose consciousness. And then, um, you know, you have a heavy sleep, which is where you've lost continence. Uh, you know, um, it, it, what happens when, you know, when you fall asleep, you get a relaxation, a complete relaxation of all the limbs. And that's why you can pass wind without knowing it. Um, so any type of... Uh, and then you have uh, lustful emission of fluid, which is medhi. So if you get medhi, it breaks the wudu. Intoxication, loss of consciousness. If you faint, pass out. Insanity, uh, temporary insanity. People that just completely... And that's why, I mean, even in like talaq, if somebody goes completely nuts and divorces their wife and can't remember even that they did that, something like that, it's similar, that they've lost their wudu. And then involuntary lustless emission, which is wedi. Wedi and Medhi are similar. Uh, the Medhi is, is uh, more, um, it's, uh, it's more, uh, less opaque than the, the Wedi. But they're, they're, uh, and then touching if pleasure is experienced or intended with a person for whom pleasure occurs naturally. So, uh, for instance, what, what they mean by that, and they mention this, if, if, uh, if, if somebody had a child on their, on their lap or something, and there was j- just there's uh, sense senses between in the thighs or something like that. That's not intended pleasure, nor nor is it naturally occurring type pleasure. So that that type of thing would be excused. But if it's if they uh, if they touch somebody and they intend pleasure, like a kiss or touching the hand, uh, an amorous, you know, it would be like an amorous uh, touch then that breaks uh, the wudu, it, even, whether they find it or not. If they, if they touch somebody, like a goodbye kiss does not break wudu. 
the ulama, the Maliki say, if it's a kiss on the lips, generally it breaks the wudu. Just because it's mavinnat al It's It's a place where normally people derive pleasure. But if it was a goodbye kiss that was quick, um, then it doesn't. And... Uh, And then a woman's insertion of her hand into her labial folds breaks the wudu. A man touching his penis with the inside or the sides of the palms or fingers. So it's not on the outside, but on the insides of the palms or the sides of the fingers. And then doubt concerning an event, a hadith, that nullifies wudu unless one has constant doubt. So the muaswas is somebody who's always doubting. Those people build on their, uh, they ignore their doubt. But if you have doubt, and then obviously, الْيَقِينُ لَا يَزُورُ بِالشَّكْ is a qa'idah. That if, if doubt is not removed, uh, certainty is not removed by doubt. So if you were certain you were in wudu, and then you had a doubt, then you have your wudu. But if you doubt whether you were in wudu, you see, then, then you, you're not, you, 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 you have to make your wudu up. I mean, that's the rule. Certainty is not removed by doubt. So if you were certain in the first place that you had wudu, and then later you start thinking, am, am I still in wudu? Unless you can remember something, the wudu is considered um, valid. And then obviously apostasy, because yuhbitu, it removes all of your actions. Um, and then some of the things that Khalil mentions, abnormal discharge of sperm, many due to an abnormal experience such as being bitten by a scorpion, uh, which resulted uh, in a discharge of sperm, uh, and the exit of a man's sperm from a woman's body after intercourse and performing uh, the ghusl, doubt concerning which came first, wudu being nullified or performing wudu. Um, so when, when, when you don't, when you can't remember like that. Um, and then the order of wudu, uh, so here, this is the order of the wudu. You find a pure place in which to perform the wudu. You place the water vessel on the right side if it is open to facilitate dipping with the right hand and on the left if it is closed to facilitate pouring into the right hand. You brush your teeth. You say Bismillah if in a pure place. Wash the right hand thrice up to and including the wrist. Then wash the left hand thrice up to and including the wrist. Rinse the mouth thrice. Lightly sniff water into the nostrils and blow it out thrice. Focus your intention, niya at the first limb that is obligatory to wash, which is the face. So that's at the point where you do, because that's the first fard that you move into, is washing the face. And that's the point where you make the niyyah. Uh, and the intention is in the heart, and it's one of three forms. Mahalu niyyah al-qalb. But that also, if somebody is muwaswas, if, if they have a lot of doubt, they should say it out loud. Nawaitara wudu. You know, I make the intention of wudu istibahatan li mamu'a or fardan li sarati, you know. Um, so you, you say it out loud if, if you have that, those doubts. And, those are, and then the three types, uh, removal of a state of lesser ritual impurity, the fulfillment of an obligation, rendering the worship permissible by removing a preventive. And then wash the face thrice, including skin that is visible underneath any facial hair. Wash the right hand thrice from the tips of the fingers down to and including the elbow, making sure to go between the fingers. Wash the left hand the same as the right hand. Wash the head from back, front to back once. Wipe the head from back, front, back to front once. Wipe the ears once. And then wash the right foot thrice up to and including the ankle and between the toes. It is recommended to use uh, the uh, you know, your your pinky there through the the, uh, uh, the between the toes on the left uh, pinky, and then uh, wash the left foot in the same manner as the right foot. 
And then, so that's wudu, basically. Which is the basis of your, uh, of your, um, your prayer. So I'll just go through these, um, from the text here. فرائد الوضوء سبعة وهي دلك وثور نية في بدئه ولينوي رفع حدث أو مفترض أو استباحة ممنوع عرب وغسر وجه غسره اليدين ومسح رأس غسره الرجلين So the obligations of the actions of wudu are seven rubbing, continuity, intention at its outset One must intend one of three things removal of a state of ritual impurity the fulfillment of an obligation or rendering the worship permissible by removing a preventive to worship, washing the face, both hands, wiping over the heads, washing both feet, and then وَالْفَرْضُ عَمَّ مَجْمَعُ الْأُذْنَيْنِ وَالْمِرْفَقَيْنِ عَمَّ وَالْكَعْبَيْنِ The obligation uh, uh, concerning the aforementioned includes from ear to ear, up to and including the elbows, up to and including the ankles. خَلِّ الْأَصَابِعِ الْيَدَيْنِ وَالشَّعَرِ وَجْهٍ إِذَا مِنْ تَحْتِ الْجِلْدُ الذَّهَرِ Run the fingers through the other fingers of both hands when washing and run the wet fingers through the facial hair allowing the water to reach the skin if the underlying skin is visible through the facial hair. So that, those are the fard in the Maliki Madhab. سُنَنَهُ السَّبْعُ ابْتِدَى غَسْلَ الْيَدَيْنِ وَرَدُّ مَسْحَ الرَّأْسِ مَسْحَ الْأُذُنَيْنِ the sunnah are seven, to begin washing both hands, to return from back to front, wiping the motion of the head, uh, the wiping motion of the head, to wipe both ears. Madmadatun, which is the cleaning the mouth, rinsing the mouth. Istinchaqun istintaru. Istinchaq is to breathe in, uh, in through the nose, and then istintar, to sniff, uh, blowing it out. Tartibu fardihi wa then muhtaru, and then doing, following the obligations, the order of the obligations. فضائل الوضوء وأحد عشر الفضائل أتت تسمية وبقعة قد طهرت. So eleven emirates have reached us saying Bismillah at the outset. A a place that is free of the impurities in which to perform wudu. تقليل ماء وتيمم الإناء والشفع والتثليث تثليث في مغسولنا. So conserving water and then placing the vessel on one's right side. Is a merit unless the vessel is closed. وبدو المايامني سواك ونودب ترتيب مسنونه أو مع ما يجب. So beginning with the limbs on the right, using a tooth stick or toothbrush, etc., also is recommended. Just following the order of the sunan and their respective order in relation to the obligations. وبدو مسح الرأس من مقدمي تقليل أصابع عند قدمي. To begin wiping over the head from the forehead. And to run the fingers through the toes. وكره الزيد على الفرض لدا مسح وفي الغسل على ما حدد. It's discouraged to exceed the obligatory when wiping the head or to wash beyond the region specifically prescribed. And then ruling of the one unable to maintain continuity. وعاجز الفور بنا ما لم يطول يبس العضاء في زمان معتدل. The one unable to continue continuity, maintain continuity should continue where he left off as long as the time was not longer than that which would cause his limbs to dry in moderate weather. Uh, rulings on remembrance, uh, remembering an incomplete wudu. ذاكروا فرضه بطول يفعلوا فقط وفي القرب الموالي يكملوا Whoever remembers a missed obligation after a time has elapsed need only perform it. However, if he remembers a missed obligation shortly thereafter, then he should return to it and complete that which follows. And that, that's for uh, taysir, you know, just to make things easier for people. In kana salla battarat wa man dhakar, sunnatuhu yaf'aluha lima hadar. So if he prayed with that incomplete wudu, then the prayer is invalid. However, should he remember a miss sunnah, then he need only repeat it for the subsequent prayers, and his previous prayers done with the miss sunnah are valid. نواقد الوضوء فصل نواقد الوضوء ستة عشر بول وريح سرس إذا نذر وغائط نوم ثقيل مديو سكر وإغماء جنون وديو لمس وقبلة وداء وجيدات لذة عادة كذا إن قصدت يلطاف مرأة كذا مس الذكر والشك في الحدث كفر من كفر ويجب استبراء الأخبثين مع سلت ونتر ذكر وشد داع وجاز الاستجمار من بول ذكر كغائط لام كثيرا انتشر 
So he says uh, the 16 things that nullify will do. Urine, expelled flatus, incontinence if unusual, uh, defecation, heavy sleep, lustful emission of fluid, intoxication, loss of consciousness, insanity, involuntary lustless emission, touching and kissing only if pleasure is experienced with a person for whom pleasure occurs naturally or with anyone from whom pleasure is intended. A woman's insertion of her hand into her labial folds, likewise a man's touching his penis, again with the palm or on the sides, doubt concerning an event that nullifies will do and, and the apostasy of an apostate. Uh, it is necessary to completely uh, be completely free of either urine or feces when cleaning after relieving oneself. For a male, that means extracting what remains of urine by gently squeezing and shaking the penis, but avoid using force. Using stones or toilet paper, etc., is permissible to wipe off the male's urine. Using stones, it is also permitted for both genders in the removal of feces, but not if much of either has spread past the places of exit. So what that means is if, 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 uh, if, if somebody had a lot of feces around the area, then you have to you have to use the water. If it was just at the exit, the point of exit, then it's enough to use the stone or to use paper alone. But if it's if, if it's around, then you need to use water to clean it. That's that's what he means by that. Uh, so in the next section is also. So we'll stop there, inshallah. <laughs> الحمد لله رب العالمين